Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new to this channel and you're somebody who enjoys listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. Let's begin. I swiped through countless profiles, not really expecting to find anyone that caught my interest. But, eventually, I stumbled upon a profile that immediately caught my eye. His name was Jameson, a young guy, pretty attractive, looked to be around his thirties, maybe late twenties. I swiped right on him straight away, and I'll be honest, I was hoping for a match. To my surprise, we matched, and started talking almost immediately. Our conversations were fun and flirty, and I couldn't believe my luck. He seemed like the perfect match, and I was excited to see where this would go. We exchanged numbers and started texting each other regularly. As our conversations progressed, we found out that he had a lot in common. We both loved hiking, reading, and trying out new restaurants. I was falling for him more and more with each passing day, but then he dropped a bombshell on me. During one of our conversations, he mentioned that he was a professor, not at any university, but at my university. My heart skipped a beat and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I quickly went through his profile again and realized that I had totally missed something, either that or he had put it in after I matched with him. I was excited, but kind of nervous at the same time. We decided to meet in person for our first date, and I couldn't wait to see him. As I walked towards the coffee shop where we agreed to meet, my heart was racing with anticipation. When I finally saw him, my heart skipped a beat. He looked even more handsome than I had imagined him, and I couldn't believe that he was actually interested in me. Our date was eventually everything what I hoped for and more. We talked for hours, laughing and getting to know each other. I couldn't believe how well we clicked, and I was ecstatic that our relationship was progressing so quickly. As the evening went on, I couldn't help but feel a little weirded out by the situation. I was so happy, so passionate, yet reminded by the fact that this guy was my professor. Then I realized what would happen when the new semester started, and if he was my professor, how would things end? As these thoughts lingered in my mind, I tried to push them aside and decided to enjoy the moment. After all, we had a whole summer before the new semester started, and I was determined to make the most of it. As the summer went on, our relationship started to become more complicated. We were both trying to balance our feelings for each other, and the fact that he was going to be my professor. We decided to keep our relationship a secret until we figured out a plan. The first day of the new semester arrived, and I was hoping, but I was nervous. I couldn't believe that I was going to have to sit in a class taught by the man I was dating. As I walked into the lecture hall, I could feel everyone's eyes on me. I could sense that they were wondering who I was and why I was there. And then, I saw him. Professor Jameson was standing in front of the class, and as soon as our eyes met, I could see the surprise and shock in his expression. I quickly took a seat, trying to avoid any attention. But as the class went on, I could feel the tension building. Professor Jameson was trying to act professional and not show any favoritism towards me, but I could tell that it was a struggle for him, and for me, it was equally difficult to concentrate and not think about our relationship. As the weeks went by, our relationship became more and more complicated. 
We were constantly trying to hide our feelings for each other, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. Then, one day, it all came crashing down. I was sitting in the squad, trying for an upcoming study, when I heard a group of students talking and laughing nearby. At first, I didn't pay much attention, but then I heard my name being mentioned. I listened closely, and to my horror, I realised that they were talking about my relationship with Professor Jameson. My heart sank as I realised that our secret was out. I didn't know how to react, and before I knew it, the whole class had found out about our relationship. I could already feel the judging eyes and whispers of my classmates as I walked into the lecture hall the next day. Professor Jameson was also facing backlash from his colleagues and superiors. Our relationship was considered inappropriate and against university policies. We were both called into the dean's office and were given a warning. We were told that if our friendship slash relationship continued, Professor Jameson could potentially lose his job. It was a devastating blow, and we were both heartbroken. We had to make a difficult decision, and in the end, we decided to end our relationship and part both ways. It was a painful and emotional breakup, and it affected both of us deeply. The rest of the semester was filled with awkward encounters and uncomfortable situations. I couldn't believe that my Tinder date with Professor Jameson had turned into such a complicated and embarrassing situation. I couldn't even look at him without feeling a pang of regret and sadness. As the semester came to a close, I realised that our relationship may have ended, but I had learnt something. Be careful about who you date and the consequences of your actions. I also learned that sometimes, the things we may want may not be best for us. As I walked across the graduation stage and received my diploma, I couldn't help but think about my time at the university. It was a roller coaster of emotions and experiences, and my Tinder date with Professor Jameson was definitely one that I would never forget. It may have been awkward and embarrassing, but it also taught me about love, relationships, and uh, how I'm an idiot. I've been begging my mum for a new phone since I was 13. It seems like every kid in my class had the latest iPhone or Samsung, and I was still stuck with my outdated flip phone. I've always been dreaming of owning a smartphone for years, but my parents had always said no. They had always been very controlling, and this was just another example of their overbearing nature. I remember the first time I asked my mum for a new phone. I had seen my friend's new iPhone and was blown away by all the cool features, apps and how it looked in general. I couldn't wait to get my hands on one and show it off to my friends. So, I mustered up all my courage and approached my mum, hoping to convince her to get me one. But, to my disappointment, she immediately shut down my request and said that I was too young for a fancy phone. She said to me that I could get one when I turned 18, but until then, I would have to make do with my flip phone. I was crushed. It seemed like an eternity until I turned 18, and I couldn't imagine being the only kid in high school without a smartphone. I tried to reason with my parents, and explain how important it was for me to have a new phone, but they wouldn't budge. They were always strict, and had strict rules about everything, from my bedtime to my grades. They believed that they knew what was best for me, and they wouldn't listen to any of my arguments. 
As the years went by, I continued to beg and plead for a new phone. I even offered to do extra chores around the house, or get a part-time job to save up for one myself. But my parents were firm in their decision, and refused to buy me a new phone. I felt like they didn't understand me, and were being unreasonable. It was frustrating to see my friends getting new phones every year, while I was stuck with my outdated flip phone that could barely send a text message. My frustration and resentment towards my parents only grew as I got older. I couldn't understand why they were so controlling, and wouldn't let me have the things that I wanted. It felt like they were trying to stifle my independence, and keep me under their thumb. I longed for the day when I would turn 18, and finally have the freedom to make my own choices. As my 18th birthday approached, I couldn't help but feel excited and nervous. I knew that my parents would finally be able to give in to my demands and get me a new phone. But at the same time, I was afraid that they would find another reason to deny me. However, as my birthday arrived, my parents surprised me with a wrapped present. I tore it open. I tore open the wrapping paper everywhere. And it was a new iPhone. I couldn't believe it. After years of begging and waiting, my parents had finally given in and bought me a new phone. I was over the moon and couldn't wait to get on that thing, sign up, and start chatting with my friends. But at the same time, I felt a sense of guilt and shame for being so materialistic and pushing my parents to get me something they didn't even want to. As I thanked my parents and hugged them, I realised that they had probably been saving up for this phone for years. It was around 700 bucks. They had sacrificed their own wants and desires to give me the best they could, even if it meant waiting until I turned 18. It made me feel grateful and appreciative of everything they had done for me. From that day on, I made a conscious effort to not take my parents for granted and to show them more respect and understanding. I started to see things from their perspective, and I understood why they had been so controlling. They were just trying to protect me and prepare me for the real world. They wanted me to focus on my studies and not get distracted by a phone. Having a new phone didn't magically change my relationship with my parents. We still had our disagreements and arguments, but I learned to communicate with them better and compromise when necessary. I also learned the importance of patience and that good things come to those who wait. Now, as I look back on my teenage years, I realise that my parents were not as controlling as I thought. They were just trying to be good parents and raise me to be a responsible and independent adult, and I'm grateful for that. As I scrolled through the Google Play Store, my eyes widened at the endless possibilities. There were games, social media apps, and even apps for organising my schedule and keeping track of my fitness. But one app caught my attention more than the others. Tinder. I had heard about this app from my friends, who were all excited to try it once they turned 18. It was a dating app, where you could swipe through profiles and match with people based on their pictures and a short bio. It sounded like fun, and a pretty easy way to meet people, so I decided to give it a try, with no intentions up front of actually going on a date, but I thought it would be interesting to see what all the fuss was all about. After setting up my profile, I started swiping through the seemingly endless options of men. I couldn't believe how many guys were on this app. I quickly started matching with a couple of the guys, and then after a few days I began chatting with them. One guy in particular caught my eye. His name was Jack, and he seemed like the perfect match for me. Overall, we hit it off straight away, and decided to eventually meet up for a date, after he made that decision. I was pretty scared, but I got ready for the date anyway. I wanted to make a good first impression, 
So I put on my favourite outfit and spent extra time on my hair and makeup. When I arrived at the restaurant, Jack was already there waiting for me. He looked even better in person than he did in his profile pictures. As we started talking, I couldn't help but notice a strange smell coming from Jack. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as the night went on, the smell became more and more noticeable. I tried to brush it off and focus on our conversation, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. To make matters worse, Jack started picking his nose in front of me. I was mortified and couldn't believe that someone would do something so gross on a first date. I tried to steer the conversation away from his nose picking, but he seemed completely oblivious to how uncomfortable I actually was. As the evening went on, it became clear that Jack was not the person I thought he was. He was rude to the waitstaff, constantly checked his phone during the date, and had nothing interesting to say. I couldn't believe I'd actually been excited to meet him. I started feeling anxious and also trapped. I didn't want to be rude and just leave the date early out of nowhere, but I also couldn't bear to spend any more time with Jack. I excused myself to go to the bathroom, and I took a deep breath while staring at myself in the mirror. I knew I had to make a decision, either tough it out and finish a date, or come up with an excuse to get the fuck out of there. In those moments, I remembered a piece of advice my mum had given me. Always trust your gut. Well, my gut was telling me to get out of there as soon as possible. I quickly texted my best friend and asked her to call me with an emergency so I could have an excuse just to leave. When I returned to the table, I told Jack that my friend was in trouble and I needed to go and help her. He didn't seem bothered by it and even offered to come with me. I politely declined and made my way out of the restaurant. As I walked away, I couldn't believe what had just happened. I'd gone on my first Tinder date and it was a disaster. I couldn't help but feel disappointed and a little embarrassed. I'd been so excited about meeting someone new and it had turned out to be a complete mess. As I reflected on the evening, I realised that it wasn't all bad. I'd learned a lesson. Not everyone who they are is what they appear to be online. I also learned not to trust anyone and to only trust my instincts. Not staying in a situation that made me uncomfortable was the right decision. I decided to take a break from Tinder and focus on other things in my life. I continued to use my phone though and explore the other apps that I had downloaded. I found some great games to play, connecting with old friends on Snapchat, Instagram, Kick and even started using a fitness app to track my steps and my workouts. As the days went by, I couldn't help but think about Jack and our disastrous date. It's a memory in my mind even to this day. I'm not proud of it, but for some reason I can't shake it out my brain. I wondered if I should go on another Tinder date, give Tinder another chance, and see if there was actually any decent guys on the app. After much contemplation, I decided to give it another try. This time, I was more cautious about my swiping, and took my time getting to know people before arranging to actually meet them. I also made sure to always meet in a public space, just in case things didn't go as planned. After a few more bad dates and a lot of swiping left, I finally matched with someone who seemed different. His name was Alex and he was charming, funny, and had a pretty nice smile. We talked for a few days before deciding to meet up for a date. As I nervously waited for him at the coffee shop, I couldn't help but feel excited. The exact same excitement I'd had when meeting the smelly, disgusting guy before. I had a good feeling about Alex, and I was hopeful that this date would go better than my previous one. When he arrived, I was immediately struck by how good looking he was, but more importantly, he was genuine and easy to talk to. We spent hours talking and laughing, and before I knew it, it was time to go home. 
He smelt good, which was also a plus, and helped me deal with my trauma. As we said goodbye, I couldn't help but feel a spark between us. We continued to see each other, and our relationship blossomed into something special. I couldn't believe that I'd found someone so amazing on Tinder after my disastrous first date. Looking back, I realised that my experience on Tinder was a blessing in disguise. It taught me to be more cautious and to trust my instincts when it came to dating. It also led me to Alex, who I couldn't imagine my life with. But here I am, and we're happily married eight years later. I learned that sometimes things don't go as planned, but that doesn't mean you should give up. I'm grateful for my new phone and all the apps that came with it, especially Tinder, because it led me to the love of my life. Hey, my name's Ali. This is my story about me, my iPhone, and Tinder. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. My sister went on a date back in 2015. It turns out it would be one of the most dangerous dates that any American would ever go on. Why? How? You might be asking. Well, make yourselves comfortable, grab a coffee, grab some popcorn and grab some snacks. Because, here goes. My sister, Selena, was always the type of girl that craved attention. She loved being around people. If there was a party going on, she would invite herself if she wasn't already invited. If there was a wedding, party, funeral, or anything, as long as there was people around her where she could possibly be the centre of attention, she would be there. Trust me, I know her well. Selena needed a way of calming down. She needed someone to centre her in her life. And... I personally thought that would be nothing better than a man. If she could find a calm guy that would keep her in check, stop her trying to be a fool, and actually make her safe, then I was all for it. Up until this point in her life, I had acted as that role model. It was exhausting, stressful, and 24-7. As far as I'm aware, Selena doesn't have any mental health issues. But, that's because she's never been diagnosed with any. She probably has some, we just never really bothered to get her checked. From a young age, we just accepted how she was. And while she's very difficult to deal with, she can take care of herself just fine. But, I wouldn't consider it safe. Whilst I had been the role model or protector for Selena, being her older sister... I realised that I now had to try and find a way to get someone else to fill my role. Why? Well, I had just been accepted into Algebra. Algebra being the code name for the uni I go to. I don't want to say where it is for obvious, understandable reasons. When I finally got accepted into this university, I realised that it would be a whole new life for me. But the second thing I realised was that Selena would now no longer have me. A world where Selena no longer had me was a world where Selena winds up drunk, laying down at the side of the road at four in the morning. That's not a nice sight in my mind, so I figured that I needed to find a way to get her help. Some of her friends were quite good at taking care of her, but then on the other hand there were others that used to fuel her bad side. Both of our parents were full-time workers, so... I don't think they could have done this, and even if they tried, mum and dad just didn't really care. I convinced Selena to download Tinder. She hadn't gone on a date in her entire life. She had one boyfriend back in high school when she was 14, and that was it. Apart from that, she's never spoken to any guys, with intent. And I add intent in all caps, because that's the important part here. When she goes to parties, 
weddings, social gatherings, and even funerals, guys would hit on her, but I would be there as her wing woman, or as they like to call, cock block. At the end of the day, I was there to protect her, as I know that Selena's gullible, the type of girl that would be taken advantage of, and would most likely end up at the side of the road at 3 a.m. That's the saying I always use, it's a saying my family use, and while this story might come off a bit pretentious, as if I am somehow being demeaning to my younger sister, really, it comes from a place of actual kindness and wanting to help her. Selena was a little hesitant at first and didn't really want to download Tinder, but I was forceful and told her that she needed to find someone, someone she could spend time with, someone who would do puzzles with her, someone who would stay in, socialize, not someone mad, not someone crazy, and not someone that would take advantage of her. As she started the search, it turns out this entire operation would backfire on me big time. You see the problem is, when Selena started matching with guys, her mentality in real life at all the social gatherings translated over to Tinder on her phone. So when in public, she would always be dancing, singing and saying stupid stuff to be the centre of attention, she would do the exact same on Tinder, asking the guys about what their favourite S dot E space 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 X position was, or they would ask some other weird stuff that would make them feel comfortable because, let's be real, what else are guys on Tinder for? While this was all happening I had no idea, I would ask Selena for updates on the guys she had spoken to and if she had planned any dates, but she was pretty closed up about it all, and I don't know if she was embarrassed, but she was definitely enjoying it. I was planning to move off to uni, I was going to be living in the campus, so I wouldn't be coming back until a whole month. I told her that I was planning to leave in two weeks time, so I wanted her to go on a date before then. Fast forward to only four nights until I was due to leave, I came home from my friend's house and noticed that Selena wasn't in the house. It was around 8pm so the first thing I did was went upstairs to talk to my dad. My dad spent most of his time in the office as he worked for a company and also did extra freelance work. I knocked on his door and he told me to come in, that's when I asked him if he had seen Selena. He seemed unfazed and completely unbothered, but I asked him again and made a serious point to sound worried. He kind of looked at me as if to say, really? You don't know where she is? Listen, Selena always finds her way back no matter whatever she's doing. I went back downstairs and tried to find mum, it turns out she was still in the backyard playing with our dog. I heard him bark, so I went straight out the patio doors and went to speak to her. Mum, have you seen Selena? Yes, uh, she went out with her friend, uh, maybe like an hour ago, honey. Um, I don't know what his name was. His, I think to myself. Selena didn't have any guy friends. Immediately, I thought, voila, she's actually gone on a Tinder date. But what's not so voila is that she actually went on one without telling me where, who, or when. I was pretty infuriated and decided to blow up her phone, calling her seven times in a row. For the first three rings, she just left it ringing. But after that, for the 4th, 5th, 6th and 7th calls, she hung up straight away. From then onwards, she must have put her phone on airplane mode, or just turned it off altogether. I was willing to embarrass her on a date, if it meant knowing where she was, and who she was with, but now I had no idea, and I was genuinely starting to panic. Calling the cops in this situation would never be a good idea, and most likely I would just get in a whole bunch of trouble for wasting their time. So I decided that I was going to sit on the couch, look out the front window, and keep my eyes pinned onto the driveway and road below. I sat there for the next four hours, and guess what? There was no sign of Selena anywhere, and this to me was almost enough to call the cops. At this point, 
Mum had gone to bed. It was around midnight or just gone it. Dad was still up in his office working. I interrupted him and this time he seemed a lot more concerned. He tried calling Selena on her mobile but she wasn't answering. I tried again. The phone wouldn't even ring. Something seriously wrong had happened. It was now one o'clock in the morning and we were just about to go out looking for her trying all the restaurants and bars downtown when out of nowhere I notice her walking up the drive. Her figure in her dress catches my eye and immediately I notice that something just isn't right. She's walking in the pouring rain, she's soaking wet and she didn't seem to get dropped off by anyone. Selena opens a door and walks straight in. She's crying and her hair's a mess. Her dress is soaking wet like a dripping wet towel. He's following me. What? He's following me. He's round the corner. He wouldn't let me go at first. He held me in his car and wouldn't let me leave. When I heard these words, I grabbed the phone and dialed 911 immediately while screaming at my dad to lock the front door. After he locked the front door, the three of us spoke to the dispatcher explaining exactly what we had seen, heard and witnessed. The cops arrived pretty fast, which I was kind of surprised about, because in my mind, they wouldn't really class this as an emergency anymore, as she was now safe with us. I asked Selena if he did anything, other than trying to hold her in the car against her will, she said no. When the cops finally arrived, she explained everything. But, it turns out, for those few minutes we were waiting for the cops, her date was still around the corner, waiting for her to come out. He was a bit hopeful, but he was willing to take his chance. The cops ended up finding him after leaving our house. This was totally unplanned, but I guess God had other ideas. The guy's car was confiscated, he was arrested and taken in, and me and Selena, mum and dad had to go into the station the day after to give witness statements and also let Selena say what happened. The guy got justice slapped around his big fat cheek, and after all that, I think he got exactly what he deserved. Selena was taken advantage of, or inches away from having it done, but this is why I have a huge go at her from now on. I remind her of this day, the day where she didn't tell me where she was going, the day where she didn't tell me who she was going out with. I like to think I can read people, and... I like to think that I can judge them, knowing if they treat my Selena well or not. I finished my uni, I graduated, Selena's still crazy, but thankfully, she never met any more creepo weirdos. I'd always been skeptical about online dating, but after months of being single and feeling lonely, I decided to give it a try. After swiping through countless profiles, I finally matched with a guy named Jake on Tinder. His profile picture showed a pretty handsome, smiling man at a spa. I don't know if he was with his family, but he was either with a bunch of girls who he was dating or his cousins or sisters. We started messaging each other and he was funny. He seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me, which was nice. After chatting for a few weeks, we decided to meet up for a date. I was nervous, but also looking forward to the prospect of finally meeting someone new. We agreed to meet at a trendy restaurant in the city. As I arrived, I saw Jake waiting outside. He looked good. He greeted me with a warm smile and a hug. Then, after introducing himself, we both headed back inside. The date was going perfectly. We laughed, talked about our interests, and shared stories about our lives and childhoods. I was starting to feel a connection with Jake and couldn't help but think 
that this could be the start of something worthwhile. But suddenly, Jake's face turned pale, and he excused himself from the table. His face originally looked pretty tanned, had now turned white as a ghost. I was worried, and asked if he was okay, but he assured me that he just needed some fresh air. I waited for him to come back, but after a few minutes, I decided that I needed to go check on him, as I was genuinely worried. As I made my way outside, I saw Jake leaning against a wall, looking even more pale and shaky. I rushed over to him and asked him if he needed any help. He shook his head, but before he could say anything else, he suddenly started vomiting all over the sidewalk. I was taken aback and didn't really know what to do. Jake started apologizing profusely and said that he must have eaten something bad earlier. Feeling embarrassed and guilty, Jake insisted on taking me home. He said that he didn't want to ruin the date and promised to make it up to me. I could see how uncomfortable he was and decided to let it go. I didn't want to make him feel worse than he already did. Up until this point, the date had been going well, apart from him projectile vomiting outside. As we got into his car, I couldn't help but notice the strong smell of vomit coming from him. I tried to ignore it and start giving Jake directions to my place. But as we were driving, Jake suddenly pulled over to the side of the road and started throwing up again. This time, it was even worse. He was sweating profusely and looked like he was in excruciating pain. I was panicking and didn't really know what to do. I asked Jake if he needed medical attention, but he insisted that he just needed a bit of rest. I was torn between wanting to help him and wanting to get away from the situation. But, before I could make a decision, Jake passed out. I immediately called for an ambulance and begged them to come as quick as they could. As I waited anxiously for the ambulance to arrive, I felt scared and worried. I didn't know what was happening to Jake and I was afraid that he might not make it. I called his name, tried shaking him and everything I could to wake him up, but he was completely unresponsive. When the ambulance finally arrived, I was relieved and grateful. The paramedics quickly took Jake into the ambulance and I followed behind. As we rushed to the hospital, I couldn't stop thinking about how this date had taken a terrifying turn. I had never imagined that something like this could happen on a simple first date. At the hospital, Jake was immediately taken to the emergency room while I was left in the waiting room. I sat there for what felt like hours texting my parents as to why I wouldn't be home. I was anxiously waiting for any updates. Finally, a doctor came out and informed me that Jake had suffered from severe food poisoning. He had eaten something contaminated early in the day and his body was reacting badly to it. I was relieved to know that Jake was going to be okay, but I couldn't get rid of the feeling of just complete and utter fear I started having panic attacks in the waiting room, I passed out, and a couple of the doctors had to come over and help me. I couldn't believe that something as simple as a first date had turned into a nightmare. I felt guilty for not being able to help Jake when he needed it the most. After a few hours, I was finally allowed to see Jake. He was lying in a hospital bed, looking weak and exhausted. He apologized again for ruining the date, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. I stayed with him for a while, making sure he was okay before heading home. The next few days were a blur. I visited Jake in the hospital every day, and we started getting to know each other on a deeper level. Even though our first date had been a disaster, we had managed to form a strong bond through this unexpected experience. As Jake recovered, we started going on more dates and our relationship blossomed. I couldn't believe that something as scary and unpredictable as that happened 
and happened to me of all people. My life until this point had been boring, but what a way to meet him, right? I was grateful for every moment that we had together, and couldn't imagine my life without him. Looking back, that first date with Jake was a roller coaster of emotions. It had started off with excitement and hope, then turned into fear and panic, and ended with gratitude and love. It was a reminder, but through it all, Jake showed me his strength and resilience. He'd also shown me that even in the most terrifying situations, there can be a glimmer of hope and love. Our first date may not have been perfect, but it was a reminder that sometimes the most unexpected moments can lead to the most beautiful outcomes. In that moment that he pulled over and lost consciousness, I genuinely thought that he had died. As I knelt there, wondering if I could find his pulse, I can't really explain what the feeling is. The feeling that you've just witnessed someone die, and you were the last person that they were with. That's extremely scary. At least, to me it is anyway. It was a typical Sunday night, when I first swiped right on Tinder and matched with a guy. We started chatting and hit it off right away. He was charming, funny, and seemed genuinely interested in me. We exchanged numbers and soon started texting 24-7. I was looking forward to having met someone who seemed so perfect for me. However, as our conversations progressed, I started noticing some red flags. Adam would often ask me very personal questions and would get upset if I didn't respond right away. He also seemed to know a lot about me, which I found odd considering we had only been talking for a few days, but I brushed it off thinking that he was just really into me. One day, Adam asked me if I wanted to video chat with him. At first, I didn't think that was the best of ideas, and besides, I don't have the greatest of confidence as a girl, but he kept assuring me that it would be fun and that we could just get to know each other better. So I agreed, and we set up a time to video chat later that evening. As soon as the video chat began, I noticed something strange. Adam seemed to know every detail about my room. He pointed out the posters on my wall and even mentioned the colour of my bed sheets. I was creeped out, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions. Maybe he had seen a picture of my room on social media or something, as I used to make vlogs on YouTube and post daily to Instagram, including stories and reels. But, he then said something that sent chills down my spine. You look so beautiful tonight, he said with a smirk. I hadn't even mentioned that I was getting ready for bed, so how did he know what I looked like at that moment? That's when it hit me. Something wasn't right, and it just felt like he was watching me through the webcam. I immediately ended the video call, unblocked Alex on all social media platforms. I couldn't believe that someone I'd just met on Tinder could be so creepy and invasive, but little did I know, this was just the beginning of my nightmare. The next day, I started receiving text messages from an unknown number. The messages were all from Adam, they were all creepy and stalkerish. He would describe what I was wearing, what I was doing, and even who I was with. I was terrified. How did this guy know all this information? That's when it hit me. He had most likely hacked into my phone, as to me, that was the only reasonable explanation. 
I felt violated and scared. I didn't know how to make it stop. Every time I tried to block his number, he would just create a new one and continue sending me creepy messages. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, feeling like I was being watched at all times. One day, I received a message from Adam saying that he was outside my house. I was home alone at the time, and I immediately called the police. When they arrived, they didn't find anyone outside, but they did find evidence that someone had been watching me through my windows. There were footprints in the flower bed outside my bedroom window, and the window screen had been tampered with. It was beyond terrifying. I couldn't believe that this guy had actually come to my house. I thought I was safe behind locked doors, but he had found a way to get to me. After that incident, I couldn't sleep at night. Every little sound would make me jump, and I constantly felt like I was being watched. The police were able to trace the messages back to Adam. They arrested him for stalking and invasion of privacy. I was relieved that he was finally off the street but I couldn't shake off the feeling of fear and violation. I couldn't believe that someone I'd met on a dating app could cause so much harm. The nightmare wasn't over yet. Even after Adam was arrested, I still received creepy messages from unknown numbers. I realized that he had probably installed some sort of spyware on my phone and computer, allowing him to still access my information even from prison, or remotely, somehow, question mark, I don't know. I felt like I was being watched, and there was no way of escaping it. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I hired a cybersecurity expert to go through my devices and remove any possible spyware. It was a long and expensive process, but it was worth it for my peace of mind. I also filed for a restraining order against Adam, making it illegal for him to come near me or contact me in any way. Months went by, and I slowly started to feel like I could finally move on from this terrifying experience. I changed my number, deleted all my social media accounts, and even moved to a new apartment. I thought that I'd finally escaped the clutches of my stalker, but one night, as I was getting ready for bed, I received a knock on my door. It was 2am and I was home alone. My heart was racing as all the memories came flooding back. I approached the door, thinking it could be Adam trying to get to me again. But when I looked through the peephole, I saw a police officer just standing there. He explained that Adam had been released from jail on bail and had violated a restraining order by coming close to me. He'd been standing outside my window, just like he did that first night. I couldn't believe he still had the audacity to come after me, even after everything he had put me through. The police assured me that Alex would back in custody this time for a second time and that they would do everything in their power to keep him away from me. I was grateful for the quick response and action from the police, but it was pretty bad. The times that I felt most vulnerable and scared were these few years of my life. After that incident, I decided to take extra precautions to protect myself. I installed security cameras around my house, changed my locks and even took self-defense classes. I refused to let Adam, or anyone else, make me feel like a victim ever again. Months turned into years, and slowly but surely, I started to feel safe again. I met new people, made new friends, and even started dating again. But I always made sure to be cautious, and aware of the dangers of meeting people online. Looking back, I realised how naive and trusting I was. I never thought that something like this could happen to me, but it did, and it changed my life forever. I learned the hard way that not everyone on the internet is who they say they are, and now 
I'll always make sure to prioritize my safety and security above everything else. Hey everyone, it's the commentator. I hope you're all doing well. If you enjoyed tonight's stories and you haven't left a like already, please consider doing that as it greatly supports this channel. Also, if you're new here, maybe subscribe and join us on this channel. I don't steal stories from Reddit, I don't re upload, and on top of that, I don't use AI, which is really important in 2024 because seems to me like every story channel is getting super lazy. People nowadays are very lazy and they just want to try and get the best views without doing any effort. And I think that AI makes content sloppy. It makes it unproductive and not really worth watching. So, you know, I think you guys deserve better. And as a whole, that's what I'm here on this channel for, is to hopefully bring more quality back to storytelling on YouTube. If you can subscribe, that means a lot. You'll be notified of my videos. I try to upload every single night, but occasionally I do take an evening off here and there. And also, please comment down below your opinions of the stories. Maybe you have advice for the people in the stories, or you have criticism for what they did wrong or what you would have done better. Lastly, please share my videos if you can, with your friends and family, any of your social media pages or group chats you're in, any shares will help greatly, as I'm struggling to grow my channel against a lot of these AI channels, which for some reason are getting tons of views. I don't know why YouTube must be promoting them, but anyway, I'll keep working very hard and uh, I'll bring you guys these stories every single night. And uh, thank you. So I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.